Oh yeah, it's, it's in full hunting mode now. Oh yeah, you can see the raptorial four legs waiting for something to come by. Well, hi there. This might be the most hardcore of all bugs. I say might because we've already talked about some pretty darn metal assassin bugs on this channel. But this is a bellostomatid, better known as a toe biter. And they are, at the very least, the largest of all the true bugs. Though the giant peanut bug that we found in the Amazon sure gave them a run for their money. And if you don't know what I'm talking about when I say true bugs, uh, you should watch this video. But right now, we have to talk about this largest and arguably most hardcore of true bugs, the toe biter. I really want to start by talking about what would happen if one bit you. It's very unpleasant. I mean, look at those mouth parts. Not to mention the venom. But I'll save that for when we talk about handling them. So instead, I want to talk about what amazing dads they are. Because they are really great dads. Bellostomatids are aquatic bugs. But unlike some aquatic insects that breathe using gills, which, thanks to your help, I'm starting to understand, bellostomatids still breathe air from the surface. That isn't to say that they have lungs. No insects have lungs. But they need to obtain air from the surface. Which means that they need to surface for air from time to time. But it also means that they can leave the water and even fly around. So, it certainly has its perks. But it also means that their eggs need access to air. Which would mean that they could be at risk of being eaten or of drying out. Unless somebody takes care of them. And I have to tell you, if I was in a tiny egg and had just an insect to protect me, I might pick a bellostomatid. Females of most subfamilies lay their eggs on emergent vegetation, plants that stick out of the water. And the male stays and not only defends them with his raptorial forelimbs and venom-injecting proboscis, but also regularly crawls over the eggs to keep them properly moist while they develop. But members of the subfamily Bellostomatinae take it to another level. Instead of laying her eggs on vegetation, the female lays her eggs right on the wings of the male. Which means that he can't fly for a while. But it does mean that he can keep the eggs as oxygenated and safe as he is. So they're wonderful dads. But they're wonderful pets. Well, good news! Our friend Russ from Aquarimax Pets keeps them. Because mm, you've met Russ. And he's been kind enough to bring his giant bellostomatid here so that we can give the toe biter a score based on our five categories, which are handleability, care, hardiness, availability, and upfront costs. When it comes to handleability, we give the toe biter a score of three out of five. Which might sound crazy if you've seen this. Ah! 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 Just as bad as I remembered. Uh, ah! Oh, that is worse than a sting. Ah! Of course, uh, you know, it doesn't look to be any worse than a bullet ant sting. Ah! Oh, it's stuck in my arm! It's stuck in my arm! Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Ah! Ah! <laughs> Oh my gosh! Duh, it's burning more! It's getting worse! Duh, duh. Which some people would say is about this bad. <laughs> yeah, his thing is... Will is just taking this like a champion. Come on. There we go. You got a pretty good welt already, don't you? So let us know what this feels like all along the way. It felt like a... A really strong bee sting. Yeah. It's just slowly uh, getting more and more powerful. So I really don't know how much it hurts. Fortunately, Russ is here, and Russ has been bitten by a bellostomatid, so maybe he can fill us in a little bit. I myself have been bitten by a true bug just once, and uh, it was 
surprisingly painful. And I'm not certain that I was stung by a bullet ant in the Amazon, but I was stung by something that gave me the same symptoms that Will had from his bullet ant sting. And I remember the bug bite more vividly than that sting. Plus, some bug bites can transmit diseases. That said, I know of no diseases transmitted by toe biters. Which is more than I can say for assassin bugs, and I still handled the horrid king of assassin bugs. Which only gets a two for handleability. And the reality is that it's pretty easy to pick up and handle a toe biter safely. I wouldn't just reach in and grab one willy-nilly, but uh, you know, they're not very flexible. There are many safe ways to grab one. And I don't know if you noticed this, but even when being manhandled and forced onto his toe, the toe biter was still hesitant to live up to its name. I would be very surprised if you were ever bitten by an unrestrained toe biter. I'd been holding the bug that bit me in my hand for several minutes before it decided to introduce me to the world of piercing, sucking mouth parts. But if you are bitten, how bad is it going to be? Well, let's talk about those mouth parts and how they use them. Bellostomatids are aquatic predators. Some hunt water snakes, frogs, turtles, and other aquatic fishes. They are serious predators. They grab prey with their mantis-like raptorial forelimbs and then use their piercing sucking mouth parts, which are pretty massive, to inject uh, neurotoxic saliva laden with digestive enzymes that dissolve the prey from the inside so that they can be sucked out through a straw. So it's just a huge needle that injects venom and turns your flesh into soup. I've heard it described as excruciating and... Uh... Ah! Just as bad as I remember. Ah! You probably don't want it, but it's not medically significant. Like a hog nose bite, if you happen to be allergic, it could be scarier than just painful. But if you're killed by a bellostomatid, you might be the first human killed by one. So they're unlikely to make you dead. But they do play dead as a defense, so if you don't want to be bitten, don't be too casual with seemingly dead toe biters. That's how they get you. Anyway, three. They're easy, but not enjoyable to handle, and they can pack a wallop, but not a life-threatening wallop if you do it wrong. When it comes to care and hardiness, we have one of our favorite arthropod aficionados, Russ from Aquarimax Pets, here to talk about the care of these wonderful little downstairs digit nibblers. All right, well, Russ, thank you so much for being here. Yeah. I, we've been excited to do this for a long time. Yeah. A long, long time. Tell me about keeping Bella Stomatids. Okay. Uh, well, first we can talk about the enclosure. You need at least a couple of gallons of water. You can go bigger than that, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, you can go fancier than this. This is just its travel enclosure. So at home, I have an enclosure with plants and uh, rock work and so on. How, uh, how big? And it's probably about two and a half gallons. The one okay. I, have it I, in. I love a two and a half gallon aquarium because, you know, it's small enough that even full of water, you can pick it up and move it around. Yeah. But they look really nice. Is there a reason that smaller is a little bit better for these guys than, say, a really big enclosure? Uh, in terms of feeding, it can be, depending on what kind of food you're using for them to be able to locate their food. Mm. And if it's too big, that could be an issue. Um, also, it's important to make sure that you get a secure cover. Like yes. this one, obviously, is a fairly secure cover. They do cover. fly. They do fly. Very, very good at that. So you want to make sure that they can't get out. So It's a fun thing to find in your bed when you go to... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So th those are some of the major considerations. As far as anything like filtration, it's kind of up to you. Um, they since they breathe directly atmospheric air, they don't necessarily need filtration, but that can make maintenance easier. But if you're willing to just change out the water as, as needed to maintain a good appearance, then you're probably going to be affected by the appearance of water before they're affected by the water quality. That makes so sense. As long as you keep the water looking nice, then that's probably yeah, that, enough. That's very different from a fish or an amphibian where right. you know the, the water quality is, that chemistry is entering their body very right. rapidly, they're probably not entering their body at all, except for what they might drink. So right, that, so there's a big difference there, definitely. Food-wise, they like to uh, eat, the things you mentioned that they eat, they have a very wide selection of items they'll take in the wild, and in captivity it's kind of the same. I, I tend to rely mostly on feeder insects that are readily available, like superworms and crickets that I tongue mm -hmm. feed, because it's easier to you know make sure they get to the food. But I will sometimes put like live fish in there, and they'll hunt the live fish and things like that. So. 
pretty easy to feed. Very well. Uh, so, okay. They seem like they wouldn't be very messy eaters because they liquefy everything on the inside, suck it out. So they probably don't, don't make a big mess of their food would be my guess. It is surprising that they can be kind of messy. Sometimes they don't finish something. They'll partially suck it out and then leave the rest and kind of drop it. Mm. Uh, and also when they do puncture it sometimes with their raptorial forelimbs or with their beak, there will be some bodily fluids that sort of float out into the water. So they're kind of messy, actually. That makes a lot of sense. But, but when it comes to filtration, huh. if you use filtration, which probably just having some plants and occasional water changes is fine, but if you have right. filtration, is too much current a potential problem? Yes, yes. And so I, when I do use filtration, I've done it both with and without, tend to use fairly gentle filtration. Overall, care seems pretty simple and, and straightforward. Is there anything kind of unusual that you think a person might need to know about? One thing we haven't verbally covered, but you can kind of see illustrated here, is that we have some structures that float at the top of the water. Mm. They need structures that either float at the top of the water or protrude from the water because they're going to use those for three things. One, they're going to attach to those structures as they would in the wild and wait uh, kind of to ambush their prey. Mm -hmm. um, two, they need such structures to be able to comfortably extend their breathing apparatus to the surface of the water. And they've, they've just got one of those that extends out of the end of the abdomen? They're, they're paired are they? structures, but they often two. look like one. Okay. Uh, and they'll, they can, they often use them as just uh, protruded as if it were one structure, but they're basically two so structures there. Sort of, sort of like a snorkel at the end of the abdomen. Right. Now, does it, I, I was reading, they store like a pocket of air under the wings. Is that correct? As far as I know. Okay. And so they can be sub fully submerged for a while, but if they can be at rest and able to get the end of that abdomen out of the water, that's really important so right. that they don't exhaust themselves. And probably, they probably potentially could drown. Yeah. Yeah, and if you so you need some structure like that, and the third reason for which you need to, some kind of structure for them to anchor themselves on is that um, they need to be able to leave the water occasionally. Mm. If they feel more comfortable. They'll crawl up under the top of this cork bark and just sit there for an hour or two once in a while. And so, three reasons why you need some haul out structure of some kind. That makes it. It's starting to move its position oh, right it now. Goes. Oh yeah, it's it's in full hunting mode now. Oh yeah, you can see the raptorial forelegs waiting for something to come by. <laughs> That's so cool. Okay, well, I, I think with all that in mind, uh, we are going to give the toe biter a score of five out of five for care. Okay, so I, I talked a little bit earlier. I, I have been bitten by a true bug just one time by a water strider, mm -hmm. which I think is something that's happened to you also. True, yes. But you also have been bitten by a bellostomatid. How did that happen and how did it compare? Well, I was up uh, not far away from here, up in the mountains decades ago. I was about 13 years old and uh, found my first one. And so I picked it up and uh, wasn't particularly careful about picking it up. I was just really excited. Yeah, so it's just it a giant bug. Yeah, and as I was holding it, it's grabbed me with its raptorial forelegs around my finger and just, um, <laughs> you know, uh, inserted its proboscis right into my finger and uh, it was a very strong burning sensation, but I uh, I was more interested in what was going on than <laughs> than uh, rolling around in abject misery. Um, uh, did you know what it was? I did. Okay, so you yeah. uh, did you know it wasn't dangerous? Yeah, I I, okay. I didn't know how significant the venom was, and I remember my mom was quite concerned about that and what what the effects might be, but I was reasonably confident that it wasn't medically significant and uh, you know it hurt for an hour or two uh, but it wasn't um, mind-blowingly painful and I enjoyed the rest of my uh, you know field experience that that day uh, up in the mountains looking for more creatures. So. so you were you were you were interested in what was happening I assume you rolled around and screamed for a while though. <laughs> no I, I actually wasn't uh, wasn't too bothered by it. I was, I was just more fascinated by the whole process than anything. Hmm. Interesting. But it, but it did hurt. How did it compare to the water strider? It was definitely more intense than the water strider, which I remember as a burning pain, mm -hmm. kind of a searing sensation. But uh, this was worse, but not enough to ruin my day. All right. Well, this has kind of made my day. <laughs> when it comes to hardiness, these seem 
like they're very hardy. I know their overall lifespan is not terribly long. Right. About, about how long do they tend to live? Oh, the reports I've heard are about a year. Okay. And it, that's not from a juvenile up. That's probably if you get an adult or a sub-adult. Probably. Probably. So. I've never raised one from, from a nymph, so I'm not exactly sure. But that, those are the reports I get around a year. Okay. So, so not a super long lifespan. And so, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not hardy. Right. Is there any, well, what are the things that you'd need to watch out for to make sure that you don't kill one prematurely? Well, if you do all the things we talked about, you make sure it doesn't fly out uh, and that could potentially shorten its life considerably. Mm -hmm. And you make sure it gets enough to eat. I mean, they do have hearty appetites. I think you're, you're good to go. Pretty easy. All right, well, with that in mind, we will give the toe biter a score of five out of five for hardiness as well. Uh, Russ, thank you so much for being here. If you do not subscribe to Aquarimax Pets, uh, you should fix that as, well, maybe right now. Right now, just fix it. But thank you so much for being here. This is always so much fun. Uh, thanks for having me. When it comes to availability, we give the giant toe biter a score of two out of five. The truth is that you're unlikely to see one at a pet store or an expo. You can get them online, at least from time to time, but one may also just end up in your pool or on your porch one night. So you may not always be able to get one when you're looking for one, but one may show up when you're not. When it comes to upfront costs, we give the toe biter a score of five out of five. Toe biters, even if you buy one, are not super expensive. The tank, substrate, filtration and such will cost something, but really not too much. Overall, while they're not the cheapest pet possible, you could probably get the animal and its entire setup for well under $100. Though it would definitely be possible to spend a bit more than that. And this is why, overall, we give the toe biter a score of 4.0 out of 5. Now you've got to admit, this is a totally rad bug. And when we were down in the Amazon, I don't know if you've seen this video, but we saw some unbelievably crazy insects. And the truth is, we didn't really have the supplies needed to really discover all of the craziest insects that are out there. There are so many, and we didn't focus on them nearly as much as I will on all future trips. Well, that trip was made possible thanks to our patrons at Patreon, and we've got another big trip coming up here soon thanks to your support. So I want to say thank you. And if you want to see more content like that in the future, please consider supporting us on Patreon. If what you want is the most hardcore of bugs, or at least the largest of bugs, and you don't mind the potential for a bite that would make a grown coyote howl, then the giant toe biter might just be the best pet insect for you. As always, like and subscribe, and we hope to see you real soon. Now go check out Aquarimax Pets! And you don't mind the potential for a bite that would make a grown coyote howl, then the giant toe biter might just be the best pet insect. Uh, let me say that differently a little. It was a good one though, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, I'm not all that familiar with this, but maybe Will is. Uh, Talk to me about butt snorkels. <laughs> <laughs> oh, am I? Am I, am I, am I, am I I'm, I'm the world's expert on yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> he has a line of them that he sells. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. True stink bugs, leaf footed bugs that have like little mm -hmm. bell, bottom, bell bottoms on and smell like, what do they smell like when you pick up a leaf footed bug? Mm. Oh, yeah. Um, some of them smell like apples. Yes. Like overripe apples. Yeah, well, no, it's, 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 uh, it's green apple candy. Yeah, there, it's a very smell. sweet apple yes. sort of smell. Um, so I picked one of these guys Like up. the, the Leptoglossus <laughs> occidentalis smells like that. Mm. Of all the bugs yeah. I've picked up to smell, I don't think... <laughs> no, well, it's, it's a long list. Apple. It's a long list. What was your childhood even like? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't even understand this childhood. <laughs>